Thank you, Lidang, and thank you all for coming to the talk. At this talk, uh, we're, you're going to learn about how to take existing service binaries and automatically convert them into fault-tolerant services so that if those services experience a hardware failure or an operating system crash, then the services just continue running transparently, seamlessly, and consistently on a machine that is still available. And to motivate this, I want you to think about uh, the example of flat data center storage. It was a project uh, by my colleagues at MSR about how to leverage massive I.O. resources in a locality of oblivious, oblivious manner using only one server that would serve metadata. It would tell you where all of the data was located. Unfortunately, when this server fails, the uh, service becomes unavailable and the cluster becomes unusable. And the authors of FDS understood this and they wrote in their paper that, of course, they would get around to writing Paxos leader election and uh, making the service fault tolerant. But you know how it is. Researchers are busy. They have a lot of demands on their time. Maybe they don't get around to it. Maybe eventually they leave for another company and it's, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of a sad situation. Yeah, many of you probably have had similar experiences. You've, you've written a service, uh, you, it starts to become popular and you think, oh, maybe I should have written that to be fault tolerant. And uh, so you can go back to the drawing board. You can, uh, you can, uh, there are various ways in which you can take an existing service and uh, change it to be fault tolerant. You can recode it as a deterministic state machine and use state machine replication. You can insert calls to persist state to a reliable backend like a replicated database. But this takes time to, to write, and it takes time to debug uh, because there are many pitfalls with this. You can fail to persist state uh, that you didn't notice or persist it too late after you've already exposed it to clients. You can make your state machine non-deterministic. You're going to have to do a lot of careful debugging to make sure that the service is actually fault tolerant uh, when the rubber hits the road and you actually need it. Who, who needs that? Let's, let's just not invest any developer time, let's not risk making any uh, introducing any bugs in fault tolerance, let's just take the binaries and make them fault tolerant. All right, so I hope you're all motivated now. Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is a, a classic way to do this, known as asynchronous virtual machine replication, and I'm gonna show you some downsides of that approach and how we improve on that with our new approach, which we call lightweight VM replication. I'll describe the challenges in doing LVMR and uh, the solutions that we came up with, and then I'll give you a flavor of the, perf the many performance results that you can find in the paper. So it's now time for some background on asynchronous VM replication. Uh, this is work that you may recall from seven years ago here at NSDI uh, on the system called Remus, which did asynchronous VM replication. What that means is the service is running inside of a virtual machine, and you make a copy of that virtual machine on a backup. And it runs alongside the service on the primary. And as the primary runs, you take incremental deltas of its state and ship those over to the backup. So the backup is always a little bit behind, but always ready to take over should the primary fail. Now, to deal with that little bit behind problem, you use an output buffer. Uh, basically what this means is that whenever a message Gets tr the VM tries to send a message, you block that at the output buffer. You don't let that go out to clients until you receive an acknowledgement from the backup that a state has been made durable. At that point, you know that that state is going to survive a failover and it's safe to release any packets that were generated before that state. Okay, this is great this, uh, for, for consistency, but it has a downside in terms of a, a, a client perceived performance. So the client is going to see some additional latency. And to illustrate this, we'll run a very simple experiment. We're going to replicate a VM on a LAN. We're going to have a client on the same LAN that's just pinging the server. And what we're going to see is that the 50th quantile latency of a ping is 43 milliseconds. It's going to take about 43 milliseconds to get a response from the server. And the 99.9th uh, quantile latency is about 88 milliseconds. And let's see what happens as we add additional uh, programs running on the VM that you might need to run in the background, like a virus scanner or a search indexer. The latency starts to increase as you need to ship over from the, v from the primary to the backup all the changes that these external processes are making. You can get up to 276 milliseconds. 
you'll now start to see why I have this on a logarithmic scale when we add Windows Update or dedupe. You can start to see multiple seconds of latency for a ping response just because you are running a, uh, you, you spun up temporarily a side process in the VM. So we want to eliminate this problem. And our solution is what we call lightweight virtual machine replication. So for that, I need to introduce the term lightweight virtual machine. And this is kind of a catch-all term for a variety of technologies that we've seen uh, coming out recently, uh, such as Pico processes in Zax, Google's native client, Drawbridge, Embassies, and Bascule, which came out recently and is the LVM that we are going to use. So what is an LVM? It is essentially a process. It's going to run your service. Like all other processes, it's running on a host operating system. But unlike most processes, we're going to block the, it, the lightweight virtual machine system blocks its ability to make system calls to the OS. It's going to have to rely on communicating with a, an LVM host, sometimes known as a reference monitor. And it's going to communicate that with a narrow API, in Bascule, that's 45 system calls, that allow it to, pr to get primitive operating system abstractions like memory allocation, threads, synchronization primitives, and the like. So the service process is now going to have to, is essentially, you can think of it as running on top of the host, separated by this narrow LVM API. Of course, this is no way to run an existing service binary. It's not going to be able to speak this bizarre API. So an LVM is packaged with a library operating system. The library operating system goes in the service process, the guest, provides the OS API that the service binary expects, and it's para-virtualized to be able to deal with the narrow LVM API. And an LVM system, like Bascule, may have multiple library operating systems for running services expecting different operating systems, like Windows or Linux. So we observe that this LVM API is useful not just for security and isolation and portability, as it's mostly been used for, but also as a great interface at which to capture the state. We argue that the right way to do checkpointing of such a lightweight virtual machine is to interpose on the system call interface between the operating system, the library operating system, and the host. From this vantage point, it has a good view of the internals of the process, and so it can capture a snapshot of it, as well as a snapshot of the dependencies the guest has on the host, so that those dependencies can also be migrated to the backup. By exporting the LVM API to the library operating system, we obviate the need to, to make any changes to the library operating system. By consuming the LVM API at the bottom, we obviate any changes to the LVM host. In short, we can take an existing lightweight virtual machine system and just write a new check pointer and turn it into the, a substrate that enables replication. So you can see now how we're going to go from asynchronous virtual machine replication to LVMR, lightweight virtual machine replication. So instead of running a VMM on both the primary and backup to keep in sync a virtual machine, we're going to run an LVM host and a check pointer on both sides that will keep in sync a guest, the guest consisting of a service process binary as well as a library operating system. To illustrate the practicality of LVMR, we actually built a prototype one, and we call that prototype tardigrade. So building LVMR has led us to see the many challenges in doing so, and I'm going to share those with you, as well as the solutions that we came up with. The challenges fall in basically three broad categories. First of all is maintaining consistency. So, Imagine it's the middle of the night, an unreliable failure detector has decided that the primary has failed, and it's time to switch over to the backup. Uh, the, but you, the backup needs to be elevated to the primary, and you want to do so without operator intervention. You don't want to page a human. For this, we choose vertical Paxos as a solution to ensure consistency even when reconfiguring in, in, in response to an unreliable failure detector. Another challenge is that there's a lot of performance potential here. We're going, we don't have to checkpoint an entire virtual machine anymore. We have to checkpoint merely a process, essentially. And so there are many techniques we devised to eke out all the available performance potential. And you can read about those solutions in the paper. What I'm going to spend my limited time here talking about is the last challenge, that of 
checkpointing via interposition on an existing LVM API. And the solutions we have for that, I will, I have listed here and I will elucidate on the, in the coming slide. They'll be of interest to you if you see the light and you think, okay, I want to go out and build replication for my favorite LVM. Or even if you are just an API designer and you want to know how to make your APIs amenable to checkpointing and therefore migration and replication. So we need essentially four features from an LVM API. So we need the ability to track the changes that the uh, guest is making to its memory at a fine granularity so that we can take deltas of, so we can have our snapshots be small deltas rather than the, an entire snapshot of all the memory. We need the ability to take a consistent snapshot of the process at a moment in time, and so we need to be able to temporarily quiesce all of the guest threads and capture their registers and other state. We will need to recreate the same, a, a, the same host state on the backup as the guest is expecting and, and is interacting with on the primary. And the primary way we're going to do this is by replaying the API calls that the guest made on the host OS. And to the extent that those API calls are deterministic, our job will be a lot easier. They will, it, they will cause the same host state to occur on the backup as on the primary. In general, host state ni needs to either be replayable in this way or at least regeneratable. If it's not replayable, we need to be able to capture those aspects of the host state that the guest is relying on and regenerate them on the backup. Unfortunately, an LVM API may not always have all of these features. It may not always make our job easy. We had the ability to track changed memory pages, thankfully. We did not have the ability to suspend and inspect other threads. So we had to come up with solutions, which I will describe in more detail in later slides, such as exceptions and pre-checkpointing. Not all API calls are deterministic. Some, sometimes we found non-determinism, and we needed to devise ways to hide that non-determinism at the checkpointing layer. And finally, in cases where host state is not replayable or regeneratable, we need, we, it is an unfortunate situa situation that we must remedy by exposing this condition to the guest as an error that the guest knows how to deal with and is expecting. So I'll start by talking about how to suspend and inspect other threads. The reason here is, th what's going on here is that the guest has a variety of threads. We have a thread running in the checkpointer and it sometimes decides it's time to take a checkpoint. What it's gonna do is it's gonna capture all of memory. It also wants to capture the current state of all the threads at a, at a moment in time. But the API, uh, in fact, no LVM API I know of, lets you directly suspend a thread and capture its state. So instead what we do is we use the ability to raise an exception in each of the guest threads and also to register an exception handler in the checkpointing layer. So this exception handler is going to be notified of each exception and for each exception, get a snapshot of the thread state. After all, the rationale for an exception handler is it's going to remedy some exceptional condition and then perhaps decide to resume the interrupted guest, the interrupted thread. We're gonna use that snapshot for another purpose. We're going to copy that snapshot into the checkpoint. And then we're not gonna resume the thread. We're going to pause it and wait for all the other exception handlers to checkpoint their threads and for the checkpointing thread to checkpoint all, all the changes to memory. Only after the snapshot is complete will we actually resume the guest threads. One complication here is synchronous system calls that may run for a long time. If a guest is in the middle of such a synchronous system call, it is not interruptible and what are we going to do? The common case, the API call we expect to be in any LVM API is wait, is select. Uh, wait on a list of file descriptors. Fortunately, our position as an interpositioner allows us to add an additional file descriptor to each of these lists saying, wait for all those things you wanted to wait for and also for this special event saying it's time to checkpoint. So when it's time to checkpoint, we signal this event all the weights will return into the checkpointing layer where we will stop them, pause the threads, capture their states, and then resume the weights after the checkpoint is complete. Oh, my. Okay, sorry. Okay, but what about synchronous system calls other than wait? Uh, 
any LVM API may have one. Ours, ours happen to have one in the form of stream open. What we do is what we call pre-checkpointing. So what this does is when the guest makes a system call that the checkpointer knows might take a long time, it preemptively captures the thread state before allowing the system call to begin. That way, if it becomes time to take a checkpoint and the system call is still ongoing, we've already captured a checkpoint of its state. It's already waiting for a system call to complete, and we, can, uh, we don't have to interrupt it. All right, let's move on to determinism of replay. As I said, we have to recreate a host state on the backup that matches that on the primary. So for instance, if the guest calls create semaphore on the primary, we're going to have to call create semaphore on the backup. But there is some non-determinism there. It can choose whatever, uh, whatever file descriptor identifier it wants. It doesn't have to choose one deterministically. And we'll likely choose a different one on the backup as on the primary. We need to hide this non-determinism from the guest, and we can do so by, in, by having an indirection table. We'll virtualize the file descriptors, so the guest does not see AAA, it instead sees virtual handle identifier one, and so if it, is fail, if it uh, gets captured and failed over to the backup, it will request identifier one, which will get translated into whatever the host provided there. This is a very simple form of non-determinism. You can read in the paper about a more complex form of non-determinism we encountered in a, an API call to load a binary into memory and, and uh, load a binary and to uh, map it into memory. This was subtly non-deterministic, and we had to do the same thing, the same general thing, which is mask the non-determinism in the checkpointing layer. Finally. You may run into problems where the API has some host state that can't be replayed and also can't be regenerated. In our particular case, this manifested in the networking API, which was written in at not the packet level, but exposing a socket interface. The unfortunate consequence of this is that when the guest opens a TCP connection, the TCP session state as the TCP connection continues is kept in the host, and not just the LVM host, the actual host operating system where the checkpointer has no hope of capturing, let alone regenerating it. So the upshot of this is that if the primary should fail and we fail over to the backup, the host session state is lost and the guest finds itself no longer able to communicate with clients over existing connections. We had no choice but to deal with this by, by exposing this to guests in a way that they would expect as TCP connection fail over. Fa failures. Fortunately, services are expecting to deal with this kind of, a, kind of condition. TCP connections can drop. However, it is not ideal. It would be better if we did not have to drop connections on a failover. And so we offer a lesson for API design. Think about the consequences of relegating host state below to uh, external to the guest uh, because it has implications for replication. So now let's look at some performance results. Uh, remember I showed you this slide earlier uh, where uh, talking about Remus and the time that it takes to perform a ping, about 43 milliseconds, but that increases as you add external processes, getting to be multiple seconds. If we run this experiment in tardigrade, we find it very difficult to interpret the results on this on the, because we're using a logarithmic scale that was necessary for Remus. Let's rescale that to a linear scale, and we can see that the baseline latency, is, so first of all, the baseline latency is lower. It's only about 12 milliseconds. And most importantly, the effect of external processes is, in, is practically invisible. After all, we don't have to, the uh, virus scanner or Windows update is running externally to the lightweight virtual machine, so we do not have to capture any mutations it is making to its state and, and send those to the backup and wait for them to be acknowledged. Of course, we do have to snapshot any changes that are made by the service itself. So, let, so uh, let's see the effect of that. So the regular, just, the ping, just a simple ping server doesn't dirty memory very quickly. It's not doing very much. And uh, we, don't see, we see checkpoint latency on the order of 9 to 15 milliseconds. If we artificially increase the rate at which that service dirties memory at which it uh, mutates some of its memory, we start to see the effect of in, in, term, in, uh, in the form of increased client latency. And at the point where the service is mutating memory at a rate 
half that of the underlying network bandwidth, the network bandwidth that we have available for disseminating those changes from the primary to the backup, we start to see high client latencies in excess of 100, uh, in excess of 100 milliseconds. The lesson here is that lightweight virtual machine replication is only suitable if the rate at which the service is going to dirty its memory is a fraction of the rate at which we can transmit those changes over the network. Fortunately, real services often have small rates of changes to their memory. The FDS metadata service that I used as an example earlier, while it is initially idle, check uh, the checkpointing takes 15 to 20 milliseconds because the deltas are less than a megabyte in size. As the cluster starts up and starts operating and serving up 70 clients, with disseminating data to them, learning data about, di about disks, the checkpoint interval still is within 30 to 40 milliseconds because the deltas are compact. They are under, tw uh, under two megabytes each. Another service that we uh, applied replication to is what we call ZK Lite. So this is an implementation, this is a coordination service, an implementation of the ZooKeeper API, but it is much simpler and less code than ZooKeeper itself because it doesn't worry at all about replicating its data. It doesn't worry about fault tolerance. It's just a single server running a key value store uh, that happens to s service the uh, ZooKeeper API. We, we, just, we then take that simple service and run it within Tardigrade to turn it into uh, an equivalent to ZooKeeper that is fault tolerant. The cost that you pay is increased client latency. Under modest load, you see latency from 40 to 80 plus milliseconds. And because we wrote ZK Lite in Java, which is a garbage collected language, we occasionally see latencies in excess of 100 milliseconds. A garbage collection event mutates a lot of memory, and those mutations need to be disseminated from the primary to the backup. There are many more performance results that you can read about in the paper, but I must conclude. I have four takeaways for you. It is possible to take an existing binary and make no source code changes and turn it into a fault tolerant service. service. We argue that the right way to do this is not to replicate the, an entire virtual machine, but just a lightweight virtual machine, essentially a process. This reduces the latency that you have to wait to disseminate changes, particularly the tail of that latency. If you're an LVM API designer, you need to consider the effect of your L API design on whether that makes it hard to write check pointers like we had to. And finally, LVMR is not for every service. It's for services that can, that value the, uh, the, the ease of deployment of LVMR, that can tolerate some client, some additional client perceived latency and have modest enough load that the rate of change to memory is a fraction of the network bandwidth available to disseminate it. A variety of services fall into this category, metadata services, coordination services, a niche website that is used, say, within an organization or to a modest customer base. Overall, I want, if you could take up only one message away, I want you to take away that lightweight virtual machine replication is a practical technique to take existing service binaries and render them fault tolerant. Thank you, and I'll take questions. Which side first? <laughs> All right. So, so uh, it's neat stuff. Uh, I think the ZooKeeper comparison is a potentially illuminating one. Which are the failures which this sort of replication will protect against which, sorry, I, I guess I want to ask it the other way, which is what's the relationship between the set of failures that ZooKeeper tolerates and the set of failures that you get from having a non-replicated, non-fault tolerant thing running in a replicated so, VMs like this? So the kinds of failures that you cannot tolerate with, uh, LV, with lightweight virtual machine replication are failures of the service itself, uh, that, fa that uh, bug, bugs, in the ser bugs in the service, because we assume a fail stop model. Uh, so arguably, the, there, are few, there are less opportunities for such bugs because our implementation of ZooKeeper is simpler. Hi, Justine Sherry, UC Berkeley. Awesome talk. Like, I want this in my life, in my research like, every day. <laughs> Thank uh, you. I have a question about the suspend time. So in yep. Remus, um, you do a VM suspend, and you're using uh, exceptions to cause the process to suspend. And that's actually only a small part of the actual checkpoint latency, right? You have the, the right transfer to the backup and then waiting for that. Yep. And so the suspend time is really what affects your throughput, because that's actually when you're not 
processing yeah. data. Did you measure the suspend time, and how does it compare to the suspend time for Remus? So we were primarily concerned with uh, with measuring latency uh, in in this effect in in this work because that is the dominant effect. The dominant effect. There is a modest effect on on throughput bec from having to spend time suspended, but it is a it is a small fraction of the time that you have to spend sending the sending the data across the network to is the Is it order of milliseconds or microseconds? It's it would be on the order of a on the order of a a, 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 a sub millisecond to, to suspend. So we suspending is very cheap for us. We don't have a, an elaborate exception we don't have an elaborate uh, hardware exception mechanism to deal with. Uh, and actually Linux can be para virtualized to uh, get that down even on Remus. Uh, but the, the critical time is the time that is spent uh, actually capturing the snapshot, uh, and then you can overlap run, you can overlap transmitting it to the backup with actual service. It would be an interesting avenue of future work would be to actually overlap the time to capture the snapshot with uh, running the service. You can by copy on write techniques. Fantastic, thank you. Hi, uh, Jacob Hanson, Bromium. This interesting work. Um, so assuming that uh, Remus is a good idea and all that, uh, I wonder, <laughs> couldn't you have just taken a really small Linux kernel and put the FDS servers in there, and then you would have been done? Uh, pick a, so strip down the Linux kernel and not, ru not run a bunch Yeah, of not run like the virus checker and the deduplication service and all that. Um, that would help somewhat. There are other, there are other benefits besides the, the lack of necessity to, uh, to uh, replicate external processes. Uh, for instance, the buffer cache. Uh, is a component of uh, of Linux that uh, we don't that you don't have to replicate, uh, but would be inside of a VM and it is external to our lightweight VM. Okay, thanks. Hi, Ryan Relke, uh, Brown University. So you talked a little bit about uh, non-determinism, and the example that you gave was was a non-deterministic value that was basically just a handle. So the value that is stored in the handle is non-deterministic, but we don't actually like use the value other than just to do a mapping. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on how like a non-deterministic uh, control flow might work. So like where you have a non-deterministic value and like you, the program behaves differently depending <laughs> on, uh, on, on what the value is. Uh, <laughs> I, well, we didn't encounter that with the LVM API and maybe a sensible API would not, would not have that. Uh, I'm afraid I don't <laughs> entirely understand, but I would love to talk to you uh, to, to understand that, uh, to understand your question. Well, I'm just thinking of like step. contrived examples where okay, like okay. your program like checks the time and then branches based on what the time is. Oh, okay. So, like, so this okay. probably wouldn't I, be realistic. I, okay, but. I think I understand what you're saying. So what if you query the time or you query randomness? So that, in fact, random, in fact, there is an API call to query randomness. Okay. This doesn't create a contract though between the guest and the host. So actually, yeah, we were discussing this. Uh, it's not clear determinism is exactly the right word because uh, in, but, but it's what I'm going with. Okay, so the, if, if there are some non-deterministic APIs that we can handle because they don't create a long-term contract between the guest and the host. So if the guest asks the host for a random number, it will basically store that random number in its memory. We will capture that mm. state in its memory and ship that over to the backup. There is, we, there's nothing that we need to keep uh, constant in the host. Okay. Similarly, if you ask for the time, that uh, the, the the time might be a little bit trickier because you want to make sure that the time does not go backwards. So it might at least behoove you to keep track of what the last time you produced. Okay, thank you. Hi, Marco Serafini from the Qatar Computing Research Institute. Um, if I understand your uh, system pushes the uh, updates asynchronously to the backup, right? So you yes. could have some, uh, you could miss some updates. Right? Yes, yes it so, does. Um, and this is something that a, com a coordination system like Zookeeper would not do. So ha have you evaluated whether it is feasible and what would be the cost of having a synchronous replication in your system? So, so certainly, uh, if you're trying to get maximum performance, uh, this, is not the, this is not the way to go. <laughs> because uh, this, it's being done transparently to the, it's being tr done transparently to the application. You have to just assume that every packet that goes out somehow is dependent on, so on a state that you haven't yet replicated, whereas if you carefully architected your, if you carefully architect your system, you could get much better performance. So, uh, yeah. So, so I, 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 I'm not going to try to argue that, uh, we, are comp that we would be comparable in performance mm -hmm. to a, a hand-tuned uh, zookeeper. Right. Thank you. 